This is the one with the master. Not that master. Even squeakier non-Daleks. A unicorn. A man in a unitard. And a universe of fictional characters. Not to mention the most prolific writer you've never heard of. It's called the Mind Robber. Here we go. We're embarking on a voyage all through time and all through space. Counting Daleks, Dalen Hood, and the Cybertronic race. Santarans look like taters, and Silurians all have wonky scales. And the Doctor has a TARDIS. We're reviewing all his tales. Who back when? Reviewing all of who there is. Who back when? Subscribe and read on iTunes, please. Episode by episode, we're trudging down this temporal road. Come join us on this odyssey. What other choice could there be than who back when? Who Back When? Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to C045 of Who Back When, a Doctor Who podcast. Or dog past. This week we'll be reviewing The Mind Robber, another Troughton episode. Uh, indeed, or serial, indeed. Serial, in fact. yes, absolutely, and much, much vaunted, right? I've heard such disparate things about this, this uh, serial. See, I'm, I'm getting all of my facts here from JD, who ah. quite clearly likes it. <laughs> really? At the end of the last episode. Well, you said that? Yes, he said it's much better than the Dominators. Oh, well, I don't know if that's that difficult. So, <laughs> gave I... it like a 2.1, didn't he? Or Did he? What, the Dominators? The Domin- you gave it a 2.3. You gave it like a 2 point something, I think. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm going to take it back. I think this is worse than the Dominators. Sorry, spoiler alert. Oh, oh. Okay, so here's the thing. First of all, thank you very much for joining me on a classic. Yeah, I'm a... A lifesaver is what I'm you are. I'm an able standard, <laughs> even though uh, I was vo- recently voted the second worst <laughs> Who Back When co-host. Well, take after- it from the second best co-host. <laughs> <laughs> after a guy that hates Doctor Who. <laughs> wait, that's not true. Wait, wait, I can't remember. Wasn't Rory... Wait, Rory was... Yeah, Rory, Rory was last. last. He was last. He was last. Doctor. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so since we dropped that episode, we have had a lot of conversations, ladies and gentlemen of podcast land, <laughs> about just the fragility of our own of our people. psyches yeah. and egos. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Clearly, we're not as strong as we thought we were. <laughs> Shall we jump into bite size? Let's. Bite size Continuing where we left off at the end of the Dominators, here comes lava. <laughs> And consequently, Doc and Co. escape not just the planet of Dulcis, but all of time and space. Shazam! They find themselves in a land of make-believe, controlled by the Master. Not that Master. Who in turn is plugged into a great intelligence. Not that great intelligence. Hilarity ensues! <laughs> I'm really glad they didn't have to do Shazam. <laughs> <laughs> right, B-Scow over. You, you are, are welcome. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just start off by saying that there are lots and lots of similarities it, it feels like they've repurposed ideas from previous doctor who villains and sort of sort of serial formats well see with at the risk of sounding too clever <laughs> um, is this the thing now yes this is the <laughs> is thing, it the thing? <laughs> with all fantasy and and fiction and all those sort of genres sci-fi ultimately they are like a series of archetypes that someone's just trying to come up with the best combination of them all it's almost like nothing new has ever been written, and it's just trying to find the best, like, recipe. Yeah, that's a that's a super good point. And maybe it's that there are only so many episode formulae yeah. that you can have, or that you at least have, like, that you do have in Doctor Who. Like, the, the most common one being the base under siege. Yep. Which I think Trenton brought up about Troughton in particular uh, in a previous mini. And then uh, possibly this is the other kind? Because what springs to mind for me is the Celestial Toymaker. I was going to say. Where it's just like an endless series of nonsense. Uh, it's just, you know, here's a shitty challenge followed by another rubbish challenge it's, and it's all kind of childish. It's, yeah, maniacal, uh, you know, m- maniacal playmaker, ch- you know, chess yeah, exactly. or whatever it is, making you go through a series of... And yeah, they tend to be focused around childhood as if it makes it more sinister. And that's not just that I'm, I'm you know, I, I feel like that's not confined to Doctor Who, but I don't have any good examples right now. I but, can't know, think of anything else either, but I, I think you're probably very right. It's like the crystal maze, just sinister. <laughs> I'm kind of into it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, fair enough. That's interesting. Do you also feel, because there is a bit of trivia associated with this, and I think possibly JD already mentioned this or at least alluded to it in the Dominator's review, mm. that this, I mean, the Mind Robber is a five-episode arc, but it was originally intended to be a four-episode arc. And what happened was that the previous one, the Dominator's, which was originally a six-episode arc for budgetary reasons or because it was that crap, was cut down to five episodes. And because they had to stick to a schedule, they had to cram an extra episode into this 
I wonder if it was that rights issue that you guys were talking about. Possibly. You know. oh, I don't know. They, according to, I can't remember if this is Todd's Wiki or IMDb, one of those two, according to them, it's a budgetary issue. Okay. And according to JD, it's because it was shit. <laughs> like, no one responded well to the Dominators or to that script, and they were just like, all right, well, we'll cut it down, and we'll have to cut this up. But the, the thing that they added to this one was the first episode. So do you feel, having now just briefly summarized the, the, the core concept of the show, do you feel that the first episode differs greatly from the rest of the, of the serial? I mean, I did think when watching it, that's quite a lot of time spent in nothingness. Mm. And actually, if I had no budget and I had to come up with an episode, I'd set it in nothing as well. Actually, that's very, yeah, it, it was a clever way to write themselves out of a problem, maybe. Yeah, because they didn't need to be in that holding area. That holding area did nothing. Was the holding, is, do you mean when the TARDIS explodes and they're twirling around and we get that Kodak moment of Zoe's ass? There is no, there's literally <laughs> no narrative reason for that. They could have just been, they could have just what? materialized. Do you mean the blowing up no, of the TARDIS? No, because the no. blowing up of the TARDIS is, I think, vitally important. Okay, maybe the blowing up, but I mean, that. Uh, it could have blown up by other I mean it, we did we didn't have to sojourn into the white mists of nothing uh, no I oh, suppose I guess I don't know. I, they, they, we had lots of episodes oh sorry I cut you off go for it the intelligence not the intelligence um, does the robot sort of manipulate robots what is he the the master computer yeah does manipulate them into stuff but I don't know I would I think it does probably differ really. now you say it um, that 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 seemed quite labored that bit in nothing yeah um, and those the robots turning up and not really doing anything. Oh, uh, there's so much just playing for time in yeah. the serial. I just feel like they they know that they have so little content, they just have to stretch everything out. It's like the vinegar strokes for five episodes. It's rubbish. But another reference back to the Celestial Toymaker. In that one, the Toymaker has stolen the TARDIS, and they're just separated from it, and they have to play the game in order to get to it. Mm. You are right. They don't have to blow up the TARDIS. Like, they just have to take it away. Yeah. But saying that... Wasn't it a fantastic scene? I love that scene of the TARDIS. It's in space. It's the last thing that you would expect to see. All of a sudden, it just shatters. It's mind-blowingly awesome. That was kind of cool. Bits that were bad. Okay. And if I can take myself out from, like, <laughs> uh, TV executive role here okay. to just normal Doctor Who viewer. Jamie recognising all of Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where did the bab bagpipes come from? I don't know. I, I, I felt like there was someone on the production side of things who just suddenly realized, oh, guys, we have an overlay machine. Like, we, we can play two foot uh, sets of video footage at the same time. We can just overlay them. Wouldn't that be great? And now let's do that for ten minutes. I just, I literally Because they did the same thing with Zoe as well. I know, I know. I didn't get that point because it, you thought, oh, you know, I'd recognize Scotland anyway. It's like, from like one side of a mountain? What? Um, <laughs> also, I don't know. What, I forget. What time was he plucked from? Oh, I hate... 12th century, something like that? Come on, Craig, something like that. Is it that far back? Is it that far back? I don't think so. Oh, okay, maybe not. Bing bong, future Ponkinian, that would be the mid 18th century. Bing bong. I mean, the cityscape part made more sense. Um, oh, of Zoe's homeworld or whatever it was. Yeah. yeah. Dulcia. Was so it very, very. <laughs> no, no, she's not from uh, I don't Dockers. Fucking know. She's from. <laughs> is she from like future Earth? I can't remember because they don't. They she's encounter her on. Uh, she's from 2069. Oh, good skills. I couldn't have told you that. I could only tell you that they picked her up on the human space station, the wheel in space. Yes. So it's human. So she's not a Dulcian. No, she's, she's a. a Dulcian. Yeah. She's yes, and she's she just was, like a future human kind of person. Yeah, that was like tortured and shit. In a, a skimpy Avengers style onesie. Yeah, not really. For tortured, no yeah. reason whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, well, lots of reason. When you have no content, <laughs> everyone knows you add ass. Like it's like a it's it's like a science experiment. <laughs> so you have you have a graph yes, where exactly. one is plot line and it just goes dwindling down, yeah. and the other one is ass. Yes, and then and you've got the up. you get the asthmatic point <laughs> when they cross. <laughs> Yeah, and you don't want too much, and you don't want too little. That's exactly. like the Goldilocks zone of yeah. ass to plot ratio. Absolutely, exactly. This one is just right. <laughs> <laughs> I would disagree with you. Even though every episode here is shorter than average, mm. like the shortest one is eighteen minutes long or something like that. It's much shorter than than normal. It still felt a little too long. <laughs> like five episodes of this nonsense still felt like too much. I did it. Okay. All right. Fine. So we have been talking about the companions. Jamie got chickenpox. 
during the production of this. Oh. And was taken off the production. See, I thought that was fucking wicked then how they did it. Yeah, if it's that's really what clever. That's what I'm thinking. That was very clever. Yeah, uh, JD told me that last night. I assumed that he just went on holiday. But the thing is, he got chicken pox and because they were on that crazy schedule of like, we shoot now, we edit tomorrow and the day after that we drop it on the te- on TV, they had to go ahead and shoot. And they just picked someone from one day to the next. And like literally on like a Monday they called this dude and on Tuesday he was on the show. Wearing jeans. Jamie's clothes. Also being slightly brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was very good. Uh, I He's agree. Fully conv- I had not pegged... I wasn't even going to talk about that. I thought that was fun. Yeah, I, I agree. it was cool. I think that was... Re- yeah, I think that was really cool. I think the, the game was kind of fun. The cardboard game was kind of fun. I mean, it's kind of lame, obviously. Like, why would you not be able to remember your companion's face? Like, wh- how bad a memory must you have? I don't know. I think if I had to pick out, like, your lips from a set... A board, you know... Are you a, kidding me? That, are you like, kidding me? You don't know my lips? I, d- I definitely get lost in your eyes. But, but <laughs> yeah, it's the lips... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know. If you had, like, other white people lips up, I'm not sure if I could deal. Okay. Can we talk about um, the grown man that dreams about unicorns for a second? <laughs> <laughs> and he's frightened by it. Who's ever had a unicorn dream that what? was also a nightmare? Wait, who dreams of unicorns and is scared of them? Jamie. Oh, Jamie dreams of unicorns. Oh, because he says it's like some weird Scottish thing. He doesn't recognize it as a unicorn, which I feel kind of predates Scott. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, any Scottish listeners we have. So he says, uh, so it's a unicorn. He's like, I, I guess. I'm like, <laughs> you've just heard the word. If you don't know the word, you can't just say, I guess. It's like, well, it's like a, it's like, like a dressing table. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah that's exactly. exactly yeah. We invented table. that. Do you feel like it's maybe a Chekhov kind of thing? You know how uh, Chekhov and Star Trek and TOS would always go like, oh yeah, no, no, that's a Russian invention. It's like, do you think maybe that's what Jamie does when everything is maybe, Scottish? Maybe, but I Unicorns? Thought- yeah, definitely Scottish. Medusa? <laughs> for, a, for a second there, I thought you were like, it's like Anton Chekhov, like... Oh, right? yes, yes, yes okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chekhov's unicorn, yeah. <laughs> Someone could definitely write a dissertation on that. Got um, trivia about the unicorn, by the way. Go on. Not only did they attach a horn onto a, a Do you horse, think they killed a narwhal? <laughs> they <laughs> that would have been a great one unfortunately I can't give you that get a confirmation of that theory uh, but they painted the horse that's fucked up yeah I should you know they painted the horse they couldn't find a horse that was the right shade so they painted it the right it. shade of black and white <laughs> it's not fucking technicolor guys maybe it doesn't that's matter the, what color yeah, but maybe that's the problem because it's white in the cereal right yes yeah and uh, so they needed it to be brighter I guess because I mean they, they might as well just paint it fucking blue it'll still look black I guess on black and white footage so they they must have had to do something either way what I can tell you from INB is they painted the shit out that of that is where horse. all their fucking budget went yeah horse, horse paint, paint. <laughs> <laughs> I will add a little sound bite because I feel like if anyone ever feels that they don't want to drop an F-bomb or say where the hell am I or anything like that just do what the doctor does where in time and space am I <laughs> Which really feels like he, he wants to drop an F-bomb, but he just can't. He can't allow himself to do that. That is Gallifrey for fuck. Yeah. Time and, <laughs> time and space. But also at this point, he has already clarified to everyone that he has left time and space. Yes. Yeah. Plot hole, I guess. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So initially, when Jamie had his vision of the unicorn, yeah. I thought this would be some similarly maniacal person taking their fears or something and making them manifest, which is another sort of archetype of yeah. um, or trope of, of this sort of thing, you know, yeah. uh, like Ghostbusters uh, with the Marshmallow Man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, oh, well done. But see, I'm, I'm branching out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But it wasn't that at all. No, the the master's means of world building flummoxing to me, as are his motives. And what he stitches together as characters. Also, oh. is, is he slightly, uh, you know, plagiarizing? Oh my god! Okay, all right, you know what? I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. I'm going to show you my notes. I am going to show you my notes. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this is uh, Leon just showing me a blank piece of paper. Oh, shut up. What have I written here? He's a writer, but everyone we've encountered, everything we've encountered in this world so far has been a work of plagiarism. That's in my notes. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, his means of whatever. Like, why did the master computer, that's what he's called, right? The master computer? Yeah, something like that. Why did the master computer, the MCP, why did the MCP pick this guy who is a writer because he's so creative and then only get that person to 
pick things out of a library that, by the way, they already had there. Like, there was, a, there is a scene where Jay Z are running through the actual library, right? Like, oh, here's Shakespeare. Oh, here's something else. I was like, well, couldn't they just get anyone to <laughs> like be a librarian? I mean, so the thing was about about the the MCP is actually super fucking fascinating, but never really got explained. It's like, how did they get these people? Where did they pluck them from? All that sort of stuff. Because actually, I feel like if this was done in New Who, yeah. they would have plucked a famous writer from history and used Oh, that. yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, they've got Dickens or something. You know, all that. I know they've all We even Dickens. had Dickens. Yeah, We've yeah. had Dickens. But it, you know what I'm saying? They get that type of person it, and we, inhabit their world full of... Uh, excuse me, Shakespeare code. Shakespeare code. Isn't that exactly do you know what would that? Be cool, actually, because he does... One of his creations do show up. Dumas. Oh, yeah. Right? If they'd had Alexander Dumas, Why not? Dumas, Why not? Max, you know, all that sort of shit. So, yeah, completely agree with you. Why not? And maybe that's more... Do you think maybe that is more of a new who thing? Like, you have to have someone recognisable. I think you have to... and uh, Because I think that at some juncture in, you know, when the BBC's, you know, editorial direction, it became half educational. But don't you feel that that's what this is as well? Oh, uh, no, 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 not so much. Only really... Um, Gulliver. Gulliver. Jonathan Swift's yeah. Gulliver. Um, and do you want to say, he's the best bit about this. Oh, yes. He really was. There's a bit of trivia about him as well. Okay. That was actually Jonathan Swift. <laughs> it was. <laughs> okay, so that guy has appeared on Doctor Who on a few occasions. Or he rather, he will reappear on a few occasions. And um, he, later on, played a Time Lord in something i can't remember what the episode was called <laughs> anyway so he plays a time lord called goth right and there's a theory attached to this i mean it's clearly not my theory because i haven't seen the serial in question and i don't even know this i've read this off imdb but the theory in question is that this time lord traveled back or possibly got stuck in this fictitious dimension and then pushed the doctor along a little bit like nudged him in the right direction and there is an actual piece of i think this is a novel one of the doctor who novels in which that theory is confirmed it is official doctor who canon that that guy is not uh, gulliver he's not a fictitious character he is actually the time lord goth who has been pushed into this thing bing bong future Ponkin again <laughs> i'm gonna try to pronounce this correctly goth's full name is gothapardus kerialdrapolak <laughs> And he did, in fact, appear in tons of Doctor Who following the Mind Robber. Here's the full list taken straight from the pages of TARDIS Wikia. Goth appeared on the Mind Robber. Duh. The War Games. Then in the novel War Crimes. Then another serial, The Deadly Assassin. Then two more novels, namely Future Imperfect and Legacy of the Daleks. And I'm just going to read out uh, word for word the the introductory paragraph to his bio on TARDIS Wikia, which really summarizes the whole thing. It goes, Gothapardus Kerial Drapolak, or Goth for short, was a Time Lord politician and occasional agent of the Celestial Intervention Agency. As Lord Chancellor, he became a pawn of the Master. So this is true. It is actual canon. His main alias is even listed as Gulliver. Done. Enough said. Yeah, actually, enough said. All right, let's get back to the show. Bing bong. Okay, but my big question would be, wouldn't the MCP go, hey, I didn't Who are you? you? Oh, I don't know, Time Lords are pretty clever beings. Still, I it mean... It did not take are... a, lot, a lot for the Doctor to outsmart the Master Computer. That's true, but he was he was also dispatched. I was, I don't know about you, but it seemed actually relatively unclear to me on as to who Gulliver's, you know, who, what side he was on. I always expected him to turn on them for some reason. Yeah, because he's, a, again, quote-unquote, a creation of the Master which he's obviously not the only there's only one i mean from our point of view there's only one creation of the masters and that's the carcass that uh, <laughs> lovely and fake superhero children. i was gonna ask you who who are the children i think the children are more creation i think everything's a creation but no because i mean he picks out lancelot blackbeard Sino de bergerac uh who else uh, gulliver i'm trying to remember what the other yeah. characters were rapunzel oh the kids are they Famous, possibly the only spies? creation of theirs yeah maybe or possibly the only creation of his or or maybe the the only creation of the master computers are the robots the robot soldiers oh and the tin soldiers that walk around i don't at all know what they sort of cut because that's not creating anything you're just saying names yeah you're actually just reading from books in a library provided to you by the computer also not really saying it so in their duel of wits at the end yeah which they, is they, i think literally a write-off which is <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. But it's not, is it? Because what it is, it's literary Pokemon. I mean, th- that's not writing. If you just shout the word substitute D'Artagnan, that's not writing anything. No, the only time that they actually make a sort of plot change is when the doctor goes, oh, but your anti-molecule ray gun has run out of anti-molecule juice. No, he just says it doesn't scientific it can scientifically exist and then it disappears oh that's what he says yeah, yeah. so he's like oh that's laughable that's does it and i was like okay well okay you're gonna say the next thing like you're a piece of fiction and then you'll not exist but yeah but okay so on that note there is another scene that's a little bit earlier maybe like a, an episode or two earlier than the actual write-off in which the doctor says that because he doesn't he's never heard of the carcass he can't establish him as a fictitious character it's like well i've never heard of him for all i know he's real it's like no (laughs) You've never heard of him. The only person who has heard of him just told you he's a fictitious character, and you know that everything in this universe is fictitious. Why wouldn't the entire universe suddenly just cease to be? Also, I mean, does it take complicitly... Like, does does everyone have to be complicit in their knowledge of this? Yeah, that's my point. Because she knew. Well, I mean, what if... I mean, okay, so he's never read the year 2000 comic book about the carcass. Uh, Has he read all of the other things? Has she she read... Exactly. It is, or, you know, fucking Gulliver's Travels, or any, yeah. anything else? Exactly. She's from outer space. <laughs> On top of the master, his means of world building being completely diffuse and, and nebulous. On top of that, the master computer, the MCP, has a really weird plan. Like, so, he, reading from my notes. I swear to God, these are my notes. So, I don't really understand the master plan. They want to incorporate the dock in the computer itself to sort of facilitate the progression of these of this fictitious dimension. But, they also want to kidnap all human beings and take them to that world but that's actually just so that they can invade the earth with whom earthlings like whom they can't take the fictitious characters back to earth right because those only exist in this fake universe what would they do would they then brainwash the humans and plonk them on earth i don't understand the point of it like why would they take over the earth I would think, actually, if you have a, if you're a computer or whatever that could create matter out of nothing, then you don't need anyone for anything. And who built other that than, computer, by the way? Other than the creative input, apparently. Yeah, who built it? I mean, unless it evolved, that could be a thing. Could be a computer that evolved into being. Uh, yeah. I, I well, no. Yeah. What? How? Uh, bio-inspired computing, you know, like quantum computing, genetic computing. Is that really what you think is going on here? No, Are all. you going to attribute saying, that level saying, of science to a- this serial of Doctor Who? Absolutely could. <laughs> uh, you can, like, synthetic biology, you can engineer, like, cells to do shit, right? Maybe it just engineers... I, I think that's 2016 retconning this. You have to 1968 retcon this. <laughs> I, didn't know, I, don't, I have no idea of the state of the literature in 1960, but let's say that. Well, I mean, how much... How much Realism? Do you find in doc- in classic Doctor Who science? Oh, none. But I'm. I'm I, I think that's fine. I think okay. No. Fine. fine. Okay. Fair enough. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, he, no, his motives are very unclear. But so is logic in this whole thing. I think it was just how do I? How do we do the Tri Wizard tournament? Sorry, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a Harry Potter joke. <laughs> Said uh, literally everyone in podcast land got that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How do we do that for uh, for you know this? That's that. That's essentially it. And it's a perfectly good trope. I enjoy it. The trials of Hercules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had two instances of Greek mythology, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had uh, Medusa and we had the Minotaur. Yeah. So the Minotaur is Theseus. Yep. And Medusa this is, is Perseus. Yeah. Cool. I liked him. Why not? Yeah, although that was the shittiest looking Medusa ever. What? That was so awful. I thought Medusa looked amazing. I got like Ray Harryhausen vibes off that. Absolutely not! Yeah, I, on, on a Doctor Who TV budget, it's not. that was Ray Harryhausen's no. stop motion. Because that was stop motion, wasn't it? I, Harry ha- Harryhausen would have just, I don't know. No, okay, obviously, I'm sorry, obviously the original Clash of the Titans is a crazy much better. And obviously the skeleton warriors of Army of yeah. Darkness are amazing. Harryhausen right? could have stop motioned his own feces and it would have been better i'm i'm sure he did or at least attempted to at some points ray harryhausen total ledge but now take down all the time and the effort and the money that went into those productions and instead apply the (laughs) you have a week to do this (laughs) for bbc television it's black and white and you have no money whatsoever but here's some i don't know clay yeah clay or papier mache to turn into medusa heads i thought that was pretty well done Okay, fair enough. When you put it like that. 
and also just me or did you also I mean slight angel vibes I thought you were going to say do you want a bone with you sir oh yeah I mean just a little bit that whole thing of having no eyes and being made out of papier mache I'll say you got snakes on the head you want to know what it's like to make out with a woman with snakes on the head (laughs) that's just natural Where, where do you put your hands what, what do you do? <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool, but I did get slight angel vibes. Yes. But then anything statues yeah. again. Yeah, you're right. Feel. You're right. Because um, it's sort of a, like a, a reverse angel. The angels, you can never take your eyes off, and this one, you can never put your eyes on. Maybe you know, that's how they come up with the angels. Reverse Maybe. Revusa. Yeah. Revusa. Oh, Revusa. Reverse. Revusa? <laughs> Revusa. Yeah. Revusa sounds really gross. I don't know what that is. That sounds like phlegmy and ugh, <laughs> sticky, <laughs> like anti-lube. <laughs> <laughs> Sand cork. Paper. Yeah. <laughs> cork. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, question about Medusa, actually. Mm. I may have misinterpreted something here, but so one of my notes is, uh, and I think this is what happens in the serial, why does Medusa turn to stone on seeing her own reflection? Because that, as far as I recall, is not how the actual mythological story goes. She doesn't see her own reflection. She, They just see her, yeah. and then that's okay now, and then they look at her and she's back to stone. But he, because he uses he uses the thing like like um, exactly exactly like the story goes uh, he had but, his silver but shield Perseus or whatever chops off her head exactly and then uses and actually P- Medusa was never stone no she was never stone he chops off her head and even her severed head can turn people into stone yes but upon seeing her own reflection she doesn't turn no into stone. absolutely not but I feel like that's what happens here I uh, no I feel like they just look at her and she does, after after solving the riddle essentially so why did they even need to look at a reflection why couldn't they just go this is clearly a mythological being how creepy was it that she kept like pawing at zoe's face that was kind of kind of hot as well yeah a little bit uh like... who hasn't wanted a weird papier mache medusa face fingering some space vixen i know it's number one on my list <laughs> that's why i bring it up don't look directly at her. she'll turn you into bone <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> there is no reason to. <laughs> no, that was great. I loved it. So what do you think of the uh, fake cardboard Cybermen? Oh. The, like, crackly... Like, which ones? Which ones? Oh, the, I mean the robots. Not the soldiers. No, not the soldiers, because the, the soldiers really make me think so you of... you thought they were Cybermen? No, no, but I mean, they... A lot of the same thinking went into them, right? They even have yeah. the weird, like, they're wearing headphones. I deal. literally don't know what they were, what they were about, like, where they fit in. Why they weren't more employed if they were a bigger part of the computer's, like, arsenal. Yeah. And if they aren't, what the fuck are they? I I didn't really get what the difference in terms of, you know, what their role was compared to the role of the toy soldiers. With this, that's that's essentially what I'm just saying there. And why, when you were like, you know, if you were the master computer or whatever, go find the doctor. Why would I dispatch toy soldiers (laughs) when I've got super robots? Do you think With that a the cannon in their chest? Well, do you think the toy soldiers were sort of the henchmen of the master, and the robots were the henchmen of the master computer? Because I mean, they're also technological. Yeah, but if they're in, they're not something that he would point? even be able to invent. Yeah, well, you don't want an invention going to go do your busy work, do you? You want, you want. So I think that might be it. So they're not, they're not fake. They are actual robots, I which want... I think kind of makes sense in a way. Oh, no. it doesn't make sense for me in the terms of writing. Like, why? Why were they... Why did they just go missing for, like, a couple of fucking episodes? <laughs> yeah. Do you think that they have to walk around the place as opposed to all the other characters that can just, you know, snap your fingers, boom, they're there? Like the whole... The carcass thing where it's like, oh, uh, and now the carcass arrives, boom, there's carcass. And By the way, why the fuck did they dismiss him? The carcass appears in the first place with his, whatever it is, the anti-molecular thingy disintegrator, and he has the lamest judo match with Zoe. I can't... Like, so, okay, so he kicks his ass. Yeah, she does. And that's awesome. Up until now, I don't know if this ha- is something that will change in upcoming episodes, but up until now, she's been a very cerebral character. She's not like the, you know, Venusian Aikido type I person. I mean, they, this is, I presume, like a, a reaction to the Avengers? She's wearing a unitard and... Incredibly smart, also kicks some ass. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, she kind of, I mean, with hair and outfits combined, she kind of looks like, what's her face from the Avengers? I forget her name. I can't remember either. But yeah. And for all those listening, we're not talking about Marvel. No, no. we are, No, no, no. Absolutely not. And we're also not talking about that uh, Ray Fiennes, Uma Thurman, oh, yeah. uh, Sean Connery, terrible abomination. No, God, what an awful film that was. Not that either. No. So yeah, anyway, she kicks his ass. But I feel like, all right, 
I can't fight for shit. Yeah, but you're if, right. you're, if you're going to do the same judo roll on, like, you know, move on me five times. Shame on you. I, <laughs> I am definitely going to learn. Judo me once, shame on, exactly. shame on you. <laughs> also, there's a particularly great, like, fuck up where she does it and then he goes. Oh, what? Oh, oh, I'm going to jump. And then he just jumps it. It's amazing. Uh, I'm not surprised. But, okay, so what, what re- okay, so two things boggle the mind. Number one, he's meant to have superpowers. Yes. How the shit does she do that? Well, he's supposed to have, he's, well, so I think the, this, the, way this is supposed to work and, and I was watching this when it was happening that she doesn't believe he has superpowers because she believes he's fictional oh and so therefore yeah. he doesn't. whereas the doctor doesn't know he's fictional so he retains his superpowers on the dog that's so absurd it is that's really absurd because it, it that kind of breaks the logic for me i feel like you have to believe that they are real in order for them to attain physical shape and force like power influence and the fact that he's never heard of the carcass and probably can't imagine something with superpowers and a weird ray gun as being anything real clearly the carcass just wouldn't be real no i think it's a logic thing i think he can understand that the logic of someone existing and being very strong can exist but the the science behind the whatever gun couldn't exist so that is what i'm saying it's not a difference it's not between belief it's logic to me that's a giant plot hole oh it feels it i mean what also seems baffling is that okay, so he's not a superhero. He's not a he's not super strong. He is like seven foot fucking tall though. I'm pretty yeah. sure he's pretty strong. And he's wearing that awesome muscle suits. Where do you even get that in this? I don't know, but how do you feel about maybe doing that as the next cosplay thing? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent. That's a that's a great outfit. I mean, no one's you gonna could know. Also, double as the Ultimate Warrior. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, going back to my second issue with this is that she beats him and basically goes, you're now our slave. He says that. Oh, yeah, sorry. He says that. Really? I, I'm now Which your slave. not really how slaves work. No. <laughs> but he's like, oh, I, I, I now owe you everything because you beat me? Okay, whatever. Fine. That's how this works. And then he just takes them up to the actual door, the entrance to the castle or whatever it is. At which point Zoe just goes, we don't need you anymore, now go. You have a super-powered henchman at your disposal in an e- like a very strange land inhabited by monsters and or like by robot soldiers and toy soldiers and all kinds of crazy shenanigans. Keep your mega henchman around. Don't let him go. In fact, like she doesn't let him go. She tells him to go. That is stupid. Also, the tick. The, the ticker, s- the stock ticker that Jamie oh, reads yeah, when, when they're doing the Minotaur. So does that write the book that the is that is that what that is? It, well, it's a stock ticker, quite clearly. But I mean, what purpose does it serve? I have no idea. Which is like, hey, I'm going to be down here and I'm going to write this thing and it's going to make corporeal beings of my thoughts. Can, it, can this like, not have some sort of output? For this? Yeah. Like, no, why do we need that? Come on, guys. Like, what I've been all this. Like, would it be great if, it, you know, and then maybe <laughs> I can make, like, a self-published novel out of I've it? I've written 500,000 words in my career. Quote, that must be some kind of record. End quote. Tolstoy might have <laughs> differ. Uh, most people. <laughs> most people. <laughs> you, yeah, Leo Tolstoy is just at that game. <laughs> Wow, 500,000, eh? Well done, buddy. <laughs> I'm going to put this on the fridge. <laughs> so, okay, to- somewhere towards the end, uh, the fake TARDIS bit was quite good, actually, where he's stuck well, in, a glass in a glass thing. thing. Yeah. Also, like I the- quite liked some of the riddles. You know, the... <gasps> really? Yeah, man, the, 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 the door. When it's not a door, it's... Uh, I'm. Uh, uh, it's a jar. That's fucking awesome. But I feel like I've heard that one. Yeah, that's fucking. That one I've heard, and I thought she did really well acting that part as well. Yeah. But then the the other one, and in fact, JD and I talked about this last night. Yeah. The one where it's like, oh, uh, a hand without the H and a something without the blah blah. Jamie is safe is and, sent well. and well and or and sound or whatever. I like it. Oh, I thought it was terrible. In fact, some of you out there in podcast land may not expect me to say this. That's not in my notes. In fact, what is in my notes is. Is the riddles are a little naff. No. Quote. <laughs> when a door isn't a door, it's a jar. That's fucking gold. <laughs> Drew would have loved that shit. I'm sure he does. <laughs> shall we shall we wrap this one up? Shall we go into yeah, ratings? Let's see some ratings. Reviews. Do you want to go first or shall sure. I go first? I'll go first. Okay then. Okay, so with this serial. There is, there is big woolly points, the, the first episode for a start, and yeah, there are giant plot holes. Overall, though, pretty fun. I'm a fan of the tournament, um, you know, format. format. Uh, I like, you know, 
trials and tribulations. I like that whole thing, and then a, an ultimate showdown. It gives progression, and I like riddles, so they're fun. Also, I'm really a fan of 70s tripping balls writing. <laughs> like, obviously, you all drop some acid and thought, what should we do? Let's get a unicorn, all right? <laughs> should we just get a normal horse? No, let's paint it. Let's kill a narwhal. Stick it to a head. Yeah, um, I like that because okay. it just seems... You know, when it was TV was the Wild West, and you could just do whatever, the whatever fuck you wanted. You liked. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. I really like that. Um, I didn't like the Doctor in this as much. Really, I thought. And whilst Troughton is usually, you know, gives gives such great performances, he was quite panicky, idioty, and I didn't like that necessarily. Uh, I thought Jamie and Jamie too were very good. <laughs> And I'm a relative fan of Zoe, although we didn't mention this in the the, the general review. The panic episode? The, yeah. The panic cliffhanger? Or, or, or like twice. She just like, she's like, says something relatively measured. Like, Dr. Jamie. <laughs> like, I don't know, what the fuck has happened? What have you seen off camera? Has the cameraman just been shivved? Like, why... <laughs> Yeah, it, there's. I have a vague recollection of her ha- having like weird panic attacks, but there's one in particular that stands out very vividly, and that's is it the episode two cliffhanger or the yeah. episode three cliffhanger? The actual cliffhanger, like the way that we leave the show and we don't get any more Doctor Who for a week in the late sixties, is her going back on what she was very capable of doing moments earlier, like the whole "Oh well, you're fictitious. I know that you're fictitious. I just have to say that you're fictitious, and therefore you're no longer a threat." But then, oh, it's the Medusa thing, isn't it? She's well, no, incapable of going. Oh, there's Medusa also, is not real. There's also one when the TARDIS blows up, and oh, the, and when she looks at the Doctor, and the Doctor's like having a bit of a headache. She's like, Jamie, look! Ah, and I'm, what the <laughs> fuck? Or like, stop! At least ramp up. Oh, I don't remember this. I haven't seen this very a couple of weeks now. Yeah, no, all awful. Anyway, other than those, yeah, Zoe seems like a strong character. Seems like she's yeah. going to be good, as, uh, you know, as as it all progresses, you know, does some arithmetic at some point. And yeah. All that sort of good stuff. Uh, and Which I think ties in, uh, sorry, I'm cutting you off here, but like it ties into what she was like in the very, very beginning in mm. the wheel in space. Like she's practically Vulcan. Yeah. You know, we want to see, logical. exactly. We want to see a little bit more of that. Um, yeah, definitely. All very good. Uh, so, okay. I'm going to give this a relatively strong 3.5. <laughs> what? Okay, what? Maybe. No, no, I'm sticking with it. Really? I gave this as uh, on the walk over here. Do you know, uh, the thing I can gauge is that my partner, not a Doctor Who fan, yeah. watched a little bit of this movie when we were having dinner, and she's like, man, I think I like Classic Who. Really? Based <laughs> on this? Oh, my God. I mean, the other episodes are going to blow her mind. It's because it's weird as balls. It is weird as balls, but I don't feel that it's weird in a good way. No, it's weird in a good way. Ugh. Okay, well, agree to disagree. Uh, I, I feel like... Uh, sorry, shall I jump into my little uh, summa summarum? So I, uh, I feel like... This is weird in a bad way in the exact same way that the toy maker, the Celestial Toy Maker, was weird in a bad way. When I reviewed the Celestial Toy Maker, I made it very clear there's something that I hate that I think like like really grosses me out, and that is fucking clowns. And something about this episode makes me think of that. Like when he encounters a band of kids that just speak in nursery rhymes, or when when there are like giant toy soldiers walking around, really just in such a childish manner. Like they don't seem threatening at all. They just seem like something plucked out of a children's story. Um, I want this to be a, a, a family show rather than, as in something that will appeal to the, the parents in the late 60s as much as it will to the kids. And occasionally I wanted to just shit up the kids totally, really scar them for life. And this, I felt, was a serial that catered way more to the kids, both on the childish level and, I mean, we kind of touched upon this and kind of disagreed on that. I feel on an educational level, even though it doesn't educate the kids practically, you know, this is Gulliver, this is whatever, these are, you know, D'Artagnan and Cyrano and so on and so forth, it does name drop them and I guess start a conversation about it. And I'm sure it did back then. The master, <laughs> I don't really get the master. I mean, the, he's he's just some dude. I, I like that he's just some dude who's been kidnapped. And then when the monster computer gets destroyed, we didn't talk about this, but he sort of returns to where he was back in the day. He says that he was kidnapped in 1926, by the way. Actually, that is some bullshit too, because he was quite clearly talking of what 
same like what seemed like sound mind and body. He was going, oh yeah, it's 1922, and then they got me, and I really like Ryan here. It's really fun. But do you mean he's not possessed? Or? No, no, he's not possessed, but he's still like emotionally and intellectually, he's kind of controlled by the computer, right? He's almost like resistance. He's intellectual resistance, and if the computer just has too much work and there's no like creative barrier to filter everything through and slow everything down with, then the computer blows up. It just overloads. So that's what he, how he factors in, or at least in my mind, that. That, that's how it works. Yeah, no, but what I'm getting at here is his his um his amnesia. Oh, you think that's fake? Like well, that's made up? Well, it seemed weird. It seems incongruous because he seemed like he knew what he was doing before. Yeah, and that uh, occasionally the computer would talk through him, but then he had his own consciousness. See, what I don't get is why he doesn't suddenly start screaming and look at his hands and go like. Ah! Why am I an old dude? <laughs> you know, like, because he was kidnapped probably when he was, a, let's say, in his late 20s, early 30s. And he's now sort of served his purpose for the master computer. But aren't they outside time? Yeah, but he's also an old dude. Do you think that he's going to return to his young form when, when he no, comes no, back? No, I think he was... And in fact, actually, I, or does I, he just die now? Maybe he just doesn't age whilst he's outside time. And that's when they picked it, they picked him up. He was that old in 1920, whatever. Oh, you think so? Or maybe. That's what I thought. But so, why do they... No, I don't think so. I, I, you know what? I think this is another plot hole. Because they are they are currently in a dimension outside of time and space, but the reason they want the Doctor is because he is not affected by time. Like, he is ageless. He is timeless, right? As opposed to a human who will age and wither and die. That's true. So, if, if for example, he was his, his amnesia was some, some, like, proxy mea culpa... Um, yeah, maybe. Then. Maybe it's all like, it's a defense mechanism. Yeah. So. Put a number on it. <laughs> okay. I will say, I, I thought the doctor was really good in this one. I, I thought he was really, really fun. I thought he was a little bit of a douchebag, especially when he couldn't remember what, <laughs> what Jamie looked like. It was just, it was just kind of fun. Uh, Zoe, I thought was great with the exception of the panic attacks. I guess I like Jamie one and two. Uh, Jamie, uh, Jamie one, Jamie prime was, uh, my note here is like, when did he turn into such a hunk? Like, what what happened? In the beginning, he's like action man when he's, you know, he's doing the worst job of sneaking up on someone ever. And then he's turned into cardboard cutout. And then all of a sudden, he's all floppy and dangly again. Actually, I have a question. Go for it. How? This might be just ignorant. He can read really well. Yeah, I know. Would he be able to read? Would he be able to given, read? Given when he was taking a... Uh, uh, Those specific, relatively modern words. Yeah. Cut a long story short. I would give this like a 1.4 or something, but I think the first episodes, the solution of let's have the TARDIS blow up and that very first cliffhanger, they're so strong. I'm bumping this up to a 2.0. Damn. Mm. Bing bong, future punkin here. Sorry, we did not get around to reading the uh, mini reviews that you guys sent in the night when uh, we sat down to record this episode. So I'm future punking it instead. And uh, let me tell you, we received, I, I don't know, this might be a record amount of mini reviews for any classic serial to date. I'm super duper excited to be, <laughs> to be reading all this out loud for you guys. Thank you so much for sending this in. I'm going to read them out in chronological order, i.e. the order in which we received them. Uh, and I'm going to start off with Trenton Bliss. Oh yeah, that's right. Now Trenton... Uh, Trenton has sent in a maxi review by his own admission, I will say. <laughs> and for that reason, uh, I am going to truncate it a little bit. But you can go to whobackwhen.com slash c045 whatever whatever. I'm sure you'll be able to work it out. You use the internet, right? I think so. If you go to the page for this particular podcast episode, you may even be streaming this off that page right now. You can read this review in its full splendor right there. So picking some of my favorite bits from his review, I'm going to start off with this one. A well-established drama series can afford to have a little fun and throw out the rule book from time to time, and that's especially true of Doctor Who, about which the show's first producer, Verity Lambert, said, quote, you could do almost anything you wanted. It's this very flexibility of formats that gives flight to the mind robber when it could have sunk like a brick and makes it one of the great stories, Trenton says. He goes on, in an interview for Radio Times, even Wendy Padbury said that particular story was my favorite. It was very different from any other. It was so innovative and I just loved that. It was also quite scary with toy soldiers, a forest of letters and the puzzles. It was a very interesting idea. He goes on, a little bit further down the page, Pages, plural. Yes, this is a Maxi review. He goes on. Then there's Zoe's tussle with a carcass who resembles a one-time opponent of Mick McManus. <laughs> I keep expecting Kent Walton to introduce their bounce with the words, Greetings, grapple fans. 
I especially like the bit where Zoe kicks him up the arse. I'm only reading this out because Trenton Bless is a wrestling fan, and I'm assuming that this will resonate with any other wrestling fans out there in podcast land. Personally, I, I regret to admit this, I personally have no idea who Mick McManus is, nor Kent Walton. Anyway, Trenton goes on. Perhaps the Doctor isn't at his brilliant best. Forgetting what Jamie looks like makes the Doctor appear uncharacteristically stupid, as does his vault fast regarding their whereabouts. After telling Jamie and Zoe the emergency unit will take the TARDIS out of space-time, he later says, Where in time and space am I? I said this! Yes! Agreed. But his climactic duel of wits with the Master, Trenton goes on, a kind of never-ending story with freedom as the prize more than makes up for this. And he gives this a... <laughs> In classic Trenton fashion, he gives it two decimal points. He gives it 3.55. I'm going to round that up to a 3.6. Trenton, thank you so much for sending this in. It's a fantastically, really like a fantastically well-written Maxi review, so you should definitely check it out. Ladies and gentlemen of Podcast Land, uh, are you following him on Twitter? Are you not? What? That's crazy. You should. He is at Trenton Bless. That's Bless with two S's. Thanks, Trenton. Next up, we have a mini review from Chris. Chris Meister, how you doing, dude? This is a mini review. I'm going to read it out in full. He says, this serial is best described by three words. Really, really trippy. <laughs> yes, agreed. This is the most outside-of-the-box episode thus far in Doctor Who. It is like the Celestial Toymaker, but done well. In my opinion, this serial lays the groundwork for many episodes to come. The Fourth Doctor's trip to E-Space, the Entropy Wave in Logopolis, the Void during the Battle of Canary Wharf episodes, the Pandorica, the Bubble Universe in The Doctor's Wife, the God Complex, and most recently, Heaven Sent. I can't say enough praise to this serial. The one issue I take is that some of the fictional characters are not as fleshed out as others. I like Gulliver, but very few of the others. I, I also think that they should have connected this master to the one we all know, maybe an earlier regeneration. I could watch this serial over and over. I can't say it enough, I love this serial. And Chris gives this a 4.8. Holy smokes. Oh my goodness. What? 4.8? That is so very nearly top marks. That's fantastic. Great idea to make him a, to make the master an earlier regeneration, an earlier iteration of the master that we all know and have this famous love-hate relationship with. Fantastic suggestion. Yes, maybe, you know what? It's not too late. Maybe we can still retcon this. Maybe the BBC can still retcon this. And you have a huge heart. 4.8, that is an impressively generous score. Nice one. Thank you very much for sending that in. Speaking of impressive, uh, what an awesome list of Doctor Who references. Uh, references to other parts of the Who-niverse that are thematically and tonally similar. Very interesting. Looking forward to checking those out. The new Who ones I am familiar with. E-Space, don't remember that at all, even though I suppose I must have, I must have seen it. Logopolis, kind of remember it? No, I don't remember the details. Super, super cool. Thank you very much for sending that in, Chris. Next up, we have Davis. Holy smokes. This isn't just any Davis, this is THE Davis, creator of the Davis Principle. Oh, great to have you back on board, dude. <laughs> it has been a while. And in fact, I will say before going into this, the Davis Principle totes malotes applies here. For those of you who are not familiar with the Davis Principle, this is something that we encountered very early on in uh, our Who Back When reviewing days, and um, something that Davis came up with, namely that very, very many of the classic uh, serials, and I suppose actually not that few of the uh, new Who serials, are about how the Doctor slash the Doctor and his companions is slash are separated from the TARDIS, and effectively their goal in the episode or serial in question is to be reunited with said TARDIS. This very much applies here as well. So yeah, Davis, you couldn't have picked a better time to come back, dude. Here we go. Davis has said the following. Hey guys, it is Davis here. Hello, Davis. I guess now is a good a time as any to start sending in reviews again. Agreed. Probably better than any, because The Mind Robber is not only one of my favorite Trout and Serials, but one of my favorite classic serials so far. What is going on, you guys? Okay, Davis goes on. The first episode is a little bit bland, but it picks up quickly with one of the best cliffhangers I've seen yet. I can't even imagine what viewers in 1969 were thinking when the TARDIS blew up. Of course, it's famous for other reasons too, but let's not get into that. <laughs> I absolutely love the surreal nature of this episode and the constant fictional events and riddles that were thrown at the Doctor and Co. They were also insanely creative in recasting Jamie for the week that Jamie was out sick. I believe it was ch the chicken pox. Yes, it was. 
Yes, it was. Davis goes on. Really, the only negative aspects were the somewhat dull first episode and Zoe screaming a lot towards the beginning, though she was redeemed with her fight scene a little bit later on. Overall, Davis concludes, I give this serial a 4 Point six, and that's only because I know something better is coming soon. Wow, what? Am I totally mistaken? Should I not have given this a two point zero? This is insane. We've got a four point eight. We've got a four point six. Crazy, crazy bananas, man. Uh, Davis, fantastic mini. Thank you very much for sending that in. I'm thrilled that some of the things that. I don't really like, seem to be very, very popular. Seem to really, really be resonating with the rest of Whovians. Awesome stuff. And I agree with you. Yes, super clever on their part. I mean, there are lots of little clever aspects, but frankly, I disagree with you about the first episode being dull. Uh, I think I disagreed with Nick about this as well. I can't really remember now, but part of that inventiveness, I think, can be applied there as well. They hadn't originally intended to have that first episode be the first episode of this serial, so they had to just make something up on the spot, and I think they came up with a very, very good solution. So in that sense, yeah, I, I mean, I don't mind. Also, we get that classic ass shot, so <laughs> no complaints, man. Uh, Davis, awesome stuff. Thank you very much for sending that in. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of Podcast Land, who are not Davis, you can follow Davis on Twitter. Yeah, that's right. I do. So should you. He is at Shrub The. As in the shrub, but it's shrub the. Okay, here we go. Next up, we have a first-time mini-reviewer, Erin Zimmerman. That's Dr. Erin Zimmerman to you. <laughs> I sent this one in. Erin, thank you so much. Awesome. Welcome aboard. Erin goes. Hello from Canada, who back when? Long-time listener, first-time reviewer. Yay! You guys are fantastic, and I hope you keep this up through every Doctor Who episode and audiobook. In brackets, and book? There is. We'll see about the books. We'll see about the books. But yeah, certainly the <laughs> the TV episodes, audiobooks, all of them, there are like, I think literally, this is not hyperbolic in any way, I think there are actually a bajillion of them, so I'm not sure if we're going to be able to go through all of them. But yeah, we're not giving up anytime soon. I'm going to continue with this introductory paragraph because it's such a wonderful ego boost. Uh, here we go. I wish you had been podcasting back in 2009 when I watched every last reconstructed episode because it sure would have made it less painful. <laughs> but on to the mind robber. I thought this serial was great, kitschy, fun. I've loved all the sideways episodes, including Edge of Discretion. <laughs> Pardon my terrible taste. Uh, you are entirely forgiven, Erin, and also I congratulate you on your... I'm assuming intentional misspelling of this. <laughs> I can't even say it myself. Is clearly a just Oh, I I take it all back. I retract my congratulatory comments. Uh, well done for spelling it correctly. Anyway, whatever. Um, to keep this brief, here are some point form thoughts. All right, I'm gonna rattle off these bullet points. Aaron goes. Really? Fluid links and mercury vapor again? How have they not been poisoned and driven mad by now? <laughs> Maybe this explains some of the doctor's weirder quirks. <laughs> Too much mercury vapor. Yes, awesome point. And in fact, I can't believe that I forgot to bring this up myself because JD brought this up to me just like the night before I sat down with Nick to record this review. Uh, awesome point. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it's a very solid theory. Next bullet point. Could they possibly have shown more of Zoe's ass in that sparkly cat suit? Made sure to catch in the weekly, in the weekly recap too, if I recall correctly. I don't know. Could they have? I, I, I mean, I don't want to sound crude, but yes, I'd like to think that they could have. But it's a family show, Erin. I mean, stop insisting on this. <laughs> I get what you're trying to say. Yes, it was gratuitous. Agreed. Next bullet point. I love how often Jamie and the Doctor just seem to clutch at each other. Next bullet point. I thought their solution for dealing with Fraser Hines' absence for a week was brilliant, and I'm impressed at their casting of fake Jamie. Bingo. Totes Malotes agree with you. Bullet point. I found myself wondering throughout this episode if they really stuck entirely to real Gulliver quotes for his lines, and if so, how much extra trouble that conceit caused some poor writer. <laughs> yeah, uh, as far as I'm aware, yes, they did. And I think that actually just makes it all the more impressive. Now I'm kind of doubting my 2.0 score, but no. I mean, that should sort of bump it up. It's too late now, it's too late, I can't go back on my words. All right, bullet points. The animation of the Medusa was a definite highlight and looked pretty awesome, even today. But it must have been really eye-grabbing in the 1960s. Yes, thank you, finally. <laughs> hey, people, here's my friend who agrees with me. Antipenultimate bullet point. A definite low point, however, was that a, what a slow learner this serial required of the normally intelligent Zoe to be. How many attacks by fictional characters does it take to see a trend in how you defeat them? Agreed. 
Penultimate bullet point. It may be love that the doctor apparently keeps up with boys' magazines from the 1920s. (laughs) Agreed. (laughs) And final bullet point. The, in brackets, pseudo master was a great villain and one I would have liked to see again in New Who had this ended differently. Yes, I will agree with you, but I'm going to pull that back to the previous one that we heard and say, you know what? I want this to be the same master that we have today. I think that was a great idea. Aaron, thank you so much for sending this in. Please keep sending more in. Ladies and gentlemen of Podcast Land, if you want to follow Aaron on Twitter, guess what? Uh, you can. That's right. No, I'm not pulling your leg. Do it. She is at Dr. Z. That's Z with two Ds. <laughs> Thanks again, Aaron. Shazamatron, and we have one more listener review. It's not a mini, it's a maxi, so I'm going to truncate it again. Uh, this one comes from Peter Zunich, the Z-Man, Pete Meister. Pete, can I call you Pete? How you doing, buddy? Okay, so here are some of the highlights from Peter's maxi review. He goes, he starts off. I'm like, yeah, I think I might do this. I'm going to do the beginning and the end. Uh, he goes, on my first watch, I hated this one. Now I like it more and more each time I see it. Let's face it, though, it's as much sci fi Doctor Who as the Celestial Toy Maker is. Very valid comparison, dude. Only this is better in almost every way. The story is fun, the characters likable, and the sets truly imaginative and varied, but it's more fantasy than sci-fi. The handling of the fictional characters is such a fully realized concept that I couldn't wait until the next time each would appear on screen. It's ironic to say that because they are written with such perfect (laughs) two-dimensionality that it is immediately apparent that all is not quite right with any of them. Super good point. Yes. Okay. Agreed. Peter goes on. Gulliver would be a perfect Doctor Who companion in a comic book. Whoa. Yeah, I would read that. Okay. The carcass is Flash Gordon on steroids. (laughs) And Rapunzel is both innocent and regal. I melt every time she gives that half smile. (laughs) You perv. (laughs) I'm kidding, please. The children are so well coordinated in their delivery that they at once act both like individuals and as a single character. Even the robots slash guards have their own personality by not having any at all. The fight scene at the end is epic and should have been longer. Okay, all right, I guess so. Sure. He concludes, It's worth noting that this concept of being nowhere and no time will be revisited in Logopolis and other stories, but it is never represented the same as it is now. I'm not a huge fan of the totally farcical fiction land Doctor Who stories. It's why I never liked this episode before. However, there's just enough pseudoscience here to make me happy. And and so much left unexplained at the end that I find myself wanting more. Someday. It's just so not Doctor Who. And yet only Doctor Who could have done this story. I can't tell you what I would retroactively change with this story because I would be recreating a history for myself and get trapped. So instead... (laughs) I'm just going to give this a purely fictional 3.4. Peter, awesome review. Thank you very much for sending that in. Uh, (laughs) I love the sign-off. I love the carcass Flash Gordon on steroids. And I love that you perv about Rapunzel. I mean, I I can't really blame you. Um, (laughs) Still kidding about that. Don't worry. Yeah, great one. And I'm going to add a little comment to this as well. I mean, you, you compliment the sets. I couldn't agree more with you, but there's there's one little bit that I didn't read out in uh, Peter's review in which he says that, uh, hang on, I'm going to find the line. He says, the letter forest is a little bland and dark. And the the first thing that comes to my mind is, that's such a cool idea for a set. I, I do see what you mean, though. I mean, it looks very budgety. It looks like just, you know, someone turned off the lights on the soundstage and that was it. You'd need no props. You need nothing else. It's just little bits and bobs here and there. But the idea, just the concept of a forest that actually, when you look at it from above, turns out to be made out of writing is so clever and really fits this story very, very well, I think. So I both agree and on a very minor detail disagree with you. Thank you very much for sending that in, Peter. There we have it. Overall, I think it turns out I'm the Grinch because I gave this a 2.0 and everyone seems to be giving this a way, way more love than I am. You're all just better people than I am. Okay, now I've been doing this for way too long. Thanks again, everyone. Let's uh, round off this episode, shall we? Ciao, ciao. Bing bong. 
So that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. That was a nice, quick episode of Who Back When. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Well, I mean, not that much happened in this one, and it is a record short. Uh, will the next one be longer? I I think so. But I can tell you is the next one is meant to be really, really good. Ah, the invasion. What, the invasion. Yeah, it's meant to be fantastic. That's the one I, I got on DVD just recently with with all animated bits and bobs in there. So we have to have like an actual. I I feel like popcorn cocktails. Doctor Who, crazy bonanza. <laughs> wow, we're going to watch Bonanza as well. That's Why not? <laughs> okay, so the invasion's our next one. Our yeah, next for classic. classic. For new Who, it is Titanic. Oh, is that what it's called? called? I feel like it's called Titanic. I feel like it's called Voyage, Voyage of the, the Damned. Damned. Voyage of the Damned, fuck. <laughs> Voyage of the Damned, fuck. Yeah. Uh, and for Audio Who, it is still the cannibalists. Still. We'll get around to it. Don't worry about yeah, it. I'm not subbing in for you, JD. <laughs> <laughs> Until the next time, can people hit you up on Twitter? They can. I'm taking my Twitter back, and it's going to be now fun things again and not work. So, Ooh. Uh, Nick or Laylee. Mm. It's like Nick or but with Laylee. <laughs> No, no, now I'm going to disagree with you. It's exactly. Nickel like nickel. Laley. Yeah. That's not how you spell Nickel Laley. It's like nickel, but with E L E. And if you want to high five me online, I do so. I will high five you right back. I am at Ponkin. Which is an anagram of Nickop. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for listening. Catch us in the next one. Rock on and be right next to each other. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Blamo. Did you enjoy the show? Then please do what the cosmos compels you to and spread the gospel of who back when. Tell your friends. Don't have any friends? No problemo. Tell some strangers. Like us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash who back when. All in one word. Are you on Google Plus? The final's on Google Plus. That's plus who back when. And when you do, tell us why you're on Google Plus. Who Back When just got its very own Twitter account, no lie, so give us a follow. You guessed it, that's at Who Back When, all in one word. Check us out on SoundCloud, vote us up on Reddit, listen to us on Stitcher, and head on over to our website, whobackwhen.com, where you can leave a comment, submit a review of your own, and peruse our visual index of aliens, monsters, and more, which increases in Kablamos with every episode. And lastly, give us a rating and review on iTunes. Not only would it make us super chuffed, and it really, really would, but as thanks, we will transmigrate your iTunes nom de plume into the credit list of trailers for fake Doctor Who audiobooks produced by Who Back When. Have a poke around our bonus episodes to make more sense of that. That's it. Rock on and be rad and excellent to each other. Catch your ear balls in our next classic Who review, new Who review, or <laughs> still funny, audio Who review. Cha ciao. Who Back When.